Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, work we've been doing on, on complex systems, particularly on networks and on games on networks, actually. So, uh, <clears throat> so the main point of, uh, of my work in the uh, last few years is the study of the emergence of cooperation. And uh, I won't spend much time trying to motivate it, but as you know, cooperation is uh, something that is an evolutionary puzzle insofar as it's kind of stupid to help others while we should be helping ourselves. So when we are in a situation in which we should cooperate with everybody, with, uh, some, with other group, what we should do is actually nothing. So we have to understand why is it that we cooperate particularly with the strangers in uh, shaping up our society. This is an important uh, thing that worried uh, Darwin and it's only, uh, it's only appropriate to put Darwin here in Cambridge because he was my model of scientist and he was very thorough and he never could understand why cooperation could emerge. And he even uh, proposed something close to group selection to understand it instead of uh, individual selection, which was kind of uh, a heresy for him. So uh, since then, lots of people have been working on this. And uh, the Science Magazine uh, pointed out that this problem is one of the 25 most important problems for the 21st century on a special issue in 2005. And uh, the way I'm going to deal with this is, uh, as they say here, by applying evolutionary game theory. So other important uh, things in which cooperation uh, plays a relevant role are uh, in the major, uh, in the major uh, milestones of evolution in going from a level of complexity to the next one, these jumps always arise because of cooperation. And finally, another important issue in which cooperation plays a role is in the enormous cooperative projects that are undertaken in society these days, from Wikipedia to home computing to many other things. So this is really a very important subject. So to understand uh, why cooperation can emerge, there are several mechanisms that have been proposed in the past years. And this is a summary, I took it from uh, Martin Nowak's paper in 2006, of the five most relevant uh, proposals. One, of course, and this is already 50 years old, is that uh, cooperation emerges because I help my, uh, my king. If I help people who share genes with me, I'm helping my genes. So this is easy to understand, and it's no surprise. Then there are two, oh, excuse me, two mechanisms based on reciprocity, direct or indirect. Cooperation may emerge because I help those who help me. And that's direct reciprocity, and that's just fine. This is something that was also proposed some 30 years ago by Hamilton and Axelrod, and it certainly gives rise to cooperation. Even if it's indirect, I help those who I see help other people. So this eventually leads to a cooperative uh, state. Then there is the question already mentioned of group selection. This is a tricky thing, and biologists would uh, really be angry, most of them, at me if I even mention it, but the point is that if uh, selection acts on different levels and not only on the individuals, then you can explain why cooperation uh, can prevail in a society. And finally, and this is my topic today, there is the idea of uh, network reciprocity. Excuse me. Network reciprocity, as I will describe in a second, refers to the fact that I may not be interacting with everybody, but only with a restricted set of people, which I could describe in terms of a social network, for instance. And then, if these people around me happen to be cooperators, then cooperation can thrive in at least that limited region. I'll come back to this point in a second. So my game theoretical framework for discussing this is, like I said, the prisoner's dilemma. This is uh, the usual uh, payoff matrix, and I'm uh, calling C or D to cooperate or to defect. Uh, T and S are free parameters in principle. Later in my experiments, I'll fix them. But T is uh, the temptation to defect should be larger than one, and S is the risk in cooperating should be smaller than zero. Later, I'll, I'll make it zero, so the problem will not have risk, but we will still be in the context of the prisoner's dilemma. Now, I won't be using, like I said, the classical viewpoint by the evolutionary viewpoint in which I will have a population of people that 
reproduces so you can understand that they learn. Okay? So the strategy is in principle genetically associated to people and they reproduce and replace those who died. Uh, the equilibrium notion is replaced by the evolutionary stable strategies, which if in the correct framework is equivalent to Nash equilibrium, I will say something more about this in a second. But the point is that you need to specify what's the dynamics, how the population replaces, how individuals replace each other. And this is a key issue. I will come back also to this. And then the interactions are, can be one shot or repeated in classical game theory, but here we can think of them as, in any case, happening between a population that is being changing all the time. So this is the evolutionary uh, framework I want to be using. One of the, the dynamics you could use, and this is the most famous, is the replicator equation. The replicator equation is uh, written down here, and it's, it describes a population in which everybody can interact with everybody else. There is a round of games, or an infinite round of uh, games, uh, in which everybody interacts with everybody else, collects payoff, and then those who have a payoff larger than the average population grow in in size, increase their number, and those who have a smaller uh, payoff decrease in number. For a two uh, type, for a two type of strategies as we are discussing here, cooperation and defection, we have an equation, a simple equation like this one, which can be written this way, or if one computes the payoffs of the cooperators and the defectors, it becomes this. For the replicator equation, it can be rigorously proven that the attractors are the Nash equilibria of the game. So, in the case of the prisoner's dilemma, no matter which is the initial condition, this equation will tell you that all the population will go to defection. Okay? So, how comes network reciprocity in the game? As I said before, the replicator equation describes a well-mixed population. Everybody can interact with everybody. Now, the idea put forward by Martin Nowak and Lord Robert May in 92 is that if you don't interact with anybody else, you can sort of... Uh, uh, send out or uh, prevent the defectors around you from getting you exploited, from exploiting you, okay? So you can form kind of a cluster and leave the defector guy alone on one side. Now, to describe this, what you do is use networks or graphs. If you are in the well-mixed population setting, what you are doing is considering a population which is in a complete graph. This guy can interact with this five other guys, and the same is true of everybody. If you restrict this, you can have something like, in this case, it's a social network, in which, for instance, this guy here interacts with all these guys, and this guy here only interacts with these two, okay? So this is the step we are taking. Once you do this, and don't ask me why I'm not really sure, this topic became extremely fashionable among complex system physicists, and there have been I'm not exaggerating hundreds of papers on games and networks in the physics literature. You can go into this review paper of 2007. It has over 500 references, or 400. And this is, uh, this is one of my own. It's smaller, but it, it has also quite a few references. And the literature has kept growing, only on the theoretical side. There's all these papers, at least in this field, are theoretical. And theoretical means that they come up with, uh, like uh, Sanjeev said, that I was a mathematician, but I must confess that I'm a physicist, although I'm in a math department. And physicists like a spherical chaos. So you come up with a model, with a toy model, and say, well, this is my model, and I study it, and it's so fine. And this is what we have been doing. So this is what motivated me to go into the work I'm going to describe. So later, I will consider, uh, as models for this situation, either a lattice, a regular graph in which everybody interacts with four or eight neighbors around them, or an inhomogeneous lattice, which can be of uh, degrees similar in, for the whole population, or something like a scale-free network, which should be much more uh, broad in distribution. Okay, as I said, you have to specify the dynamics. Now that you don't have a well-mixed population, you have to tell what happens. In the original setup by Novak and May, they used these dynamics. The guy around you in your neighborhood that had the largest payoff replaces you if your payoff was smaller, okay? Or in other words, if you want to see it as learning, I will copy the action of the guy around me with the largest payoff. And 
uh, I'm assuming the information uh, context is the same in the interaction context. I only see those who I play with. Okay? So with these dynamics, what Noah and May saw was the following. Here I'm plotting the fraction of cooperators in the population in the asymptotic state when the evolution is more or less in a constant state as a function of the temptation to defect. This is the payoff to the defector against a cooperator. Okay? If we were in a well-mixed population in the replicator equation, you would not see any cooperation at all. You would only see zero here. However, in a square lattice with eight neighbors as they used, you have high levels of cooperation, understood as high fraction of cooperators in the population, for very large temptation levels up to this point here. Okay, which is kind of strange. At least it's different from the result from the well-mixed population. So this was what they said, and this is actually our simulations, just uh, checking the results, so everything is, is fine. However, as I said, the dynamics here is crucial. So you could come up with very many other dynamics. And this is really a short list of what you could do. For instance... Uh, the seminal result. Excuse me? The, the seminal result. Yeah. What, what exactly does it do? I mean, is it, this is, a, the, is, is it a set of simulations? Yeah, it's just simulations. And actually, is they were more... No, 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 it's just simulations. It's a paper published in Nature entitled Evolutionary Games and Spatial Chaos. Yes. They are more interested in the kind of strange patterns that appear in the population. What's the latest on that? I mean, are there any analytical results? No, no on the lattice. There are approximate results from physics using mean field approximations, but that amounts to have, again, kind of a replicator equation for an effective well-mixed population. But there's no exact results. So, like I was saying, you could think of very many other dynamics. So this was Nowak and Mace, but you could use this one, which is proportional update. I just look at one of my neighbors at random and copy her strategy, her action, with a probability depending on the difference of the payoffs. And this is what's written here. That's interesting because if you do that, uh, you can prove that in the continuum limit in which you forget about the network and actually go back to interacting with everybody else, you recover the replicator equation. So that's an interesting dynamics. Looking at one neighbor at random and copying her strategy if she is doing better than you with some probability. But you could also use more economics-like strategies, like best response. You could look around, assume that everybody is going to repeat their action and compute what's your best action. Or you could do another thing that has been proposed by physicists, because this looks very much like what we call in physics Fermi distribution, in which this probability to copy includes mistakes. So I can even copy the action of somebody that's doing worse than me. Okay? And there's very many other dynamics you could invent. In fact, the point here is that all of them except best response are based on payoff differences. And I'm leaving out something that would be different to discuss, which are... Uh, learning rules, rules like reinforcement learning or similar ones. Those I won't discuss here. Now, why do I say this is crucial? Because the, this plot is not exactly like the other one because the parameterization of the, of the dilemma is a little bit different, but it doesn't matter to my point. If I do the experiment on simulations with the prisoner's dilemma with unconditional limitation, I get this line here. This is the fraction of cooperation as a function of the temptation. If I repeat it with this proportional limitation thing, I get much lower levels of cooperation. But then again, if I use best response, of course, I don't get any cooperation because the best response for a prisoner's dilemma is defecting. So you see that the result, the original result of no work and may is crucially dependent on the dynamics. But furthermore, this is done on the lattice. If I go to a scale-free network, things are reversed. Proportional limitation promotes more cooperation than unconditional limitation. So everything depends, the, the outcome depends on everything, on the type of lattice, on the dynamics, you name it. And this is something we learn through doing zillions of simulations. So the message I'm going to give you today in the remaining uh, 25 minutes of my talk is that of these five rules for the evolution of cooperation, once you sit and try to... Uh, look at the problem from the experimental viewpoint, you can conclude that this one is nonsense, that there's not such thing as network reciprocity, at least 
among humans. If you could, you could think of population, for instance, of bacteria or viruses who are known to play prisoner's dilemma, and you could arrange them appropriately, and they could reproduce in a way that could still give cooperation. But our results will show that there's no network reciprocity between humans. So this is the take-home message, in case it was not clear. And uh, now you can, if you want, leave, because the message is given. Now I'll try to substantiate it. So this is work done with a lot of people, and I want to uh, be fair and mention them all. First is my lifelong collaborator, Jose Cuesta. This is Jelena Grujic, who is our PhD student. She's going to defend next fall. These are friends from uh, the economics department at the uh, Carlos III University in Madrid, and these are the people from uh, an institute in Zaragoza, midway between Barcelona and Madrid, with, 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 with which I'm also affiliated, that were also crucial for the large scale experimental tell in the end. So, in fact, this was a much larger team. Really, Jules C. White. Okay, so, as I said, I was saying, evolutionary games on graphs, particularly the prisoner's dilemma, is everything dependent. The outcome is everything dependent. Depends on the network, depends on the initial conditions, depends on the dynamics. So the question is, which, if any, of these update rules I was showing is the one that people are using? And this, to me, is amazing that physicists that should be caring about experiments all day long haven't tried to do an experiment before what we did. It's really amazing. So the question we're asking by asking this is, in fact, how do humans behave in this setup? Okay, so the story has kind of five parts, and let me begin with the first one, which will be experimental, but then you'll see that we also do some theory. So let's go for the first one. And the first one is the largest experiment ever. Okay, so we decided we needed to do an experiment. We talked to people that were really knowledgeable on experimental economics. We are aficionados, and I apologize in advance for every uh, stupid thing I could say. But we are such low-level aficionados that when we uh, asked the experts, they told us, what you want to do is impossible. You can't do it. This is crazy. So we said, okay, let's try it anyway. So we did. And we arranged an experiment for people playing a prisoner's dilemma on a 13 by 13 lattice, which is 169 people playing at the same time with periodic boundary conditions, meaning if you are on a, excuse me, side of the lattice, you play with those on the other side. And what we did was the following. We had an experiment consisting in playing a prisoner's dilemma. This is the pay of uh, matrix in cents. And for a number of rounds, we kept them, everybody, in the same place. Okay? We told them so. At some point, what we call here control, we told them, look, now things are changing, and after every round, we are going to reshuffle the whole population. And we'll do that every round. And we did that, again, for an unspecified number of rounds, and then we came back to the experimental situation. You are fixed again. You will interact for the rest of the experiment, with the same neighbors, which may or may not be the ones you interacted with in the beginning. Okay? And then we, did, we gave them a questionnaire. So these are the data of the experiment. We took the, uh, the students from our university and from our campus, which is an engineering campus, so there were no economics students. It was a nightmare because there was no way to have this in a single room, so we had to use 10 computer rooms in two different buildings. Uh, we worked for a whole day like crazy, and we spent like 8,000 euros uh, in the experiment. So we worked like crazy because we had to prepare the, all the computer rooms with these cardboards. I spent 400 euros on cardboards mm -hmm. to set up separations between the players. So in the end, a typical post would look like this, and these are the uh, students playing the experiment. And as I said, there were 10 classrooms in different buildings. We had a control post here. This is Jelena, who actually did a great job. She did all the software by herself. It was an amazing job. And uh, we had this control because we had this limited amount of money, so we had a panic button. In case people were cooperating too much and earning too much money, we would have to kill the experiment. So... <laughs> okay. Yeah, the, the panic button was somewhere over here. So this is what happened. I'm only showing the uh, results of the experiment. I'm not showing the control part. And this one here is going to show 
the actions of the people in the first experiment, from the very beginning. Now, what, what's already depicted here is their first action. You see very many green sites. That means that in the beginning there was a lot of people cooperating. Okay? I'll show a time plot later. But just to, for some fun, you see as the experiment progresses, you are seeing more and more red actions taken. Cooperation is rapidly decreasing. Then if you look at the other experiment, already the initial condition is not very good, but when you run it, it only gets worse. There's less and less cooperation. So if you plot this, as time progresses, the fraction of people who cooperated, the black line is the first experiment. Unfortunately, the random numbers decided it, it stopped here. We told them it will stop between round 40 and 60 at some point. Then the red line is the control. Here's when we told them, look, you're going to be reshuffled after every round. And then comes experiment two. There's some attempt to resume cooperation, but again, you end up having no cooperation. Okay? So, so how, how do you define a cooperation? Those people who just chose C. In the what happens if they, change, if they sort of flip, flip between cooperating and defecting? Oh, here I'm not, I'm not discriminating among them. I'm just counting the number of people who choose C at a given time. I will go into the strategies of individuals afterwards. Yeah, around that. That should be the asymptotics, although now I believe it could be even worse if you wait long enough. But this was already very boring. It was a very hot day in Madrid. Uh, it took two hours to run the experiment. Uh, we actually had one guy falling asleep on the keyboard. I, I, I mean, <laughs> I can tell you lots of funny stories over dinner. So we, we couldn't go on. And then what, there was the money limitation as well. Okay. So, let me discuss a little bit these results. So, Novak and May use the dynamics of unconditional limitation, and with the parameters we set, we should be seeing something like an 80% of cooperation. So, we looked into the data, trying to see whether there was this imitation of the best around. Now, this is a little bit difficult to discriminate, because the best action is defection, and anyway, most people are defecting, so you can't really see it. So, to check whether we were seeing something significant or not, we just randomized all the sequences of the people a thousand times, and this is the fraction of actions you would observe as copying the best guy around. Yes? Sorry, I must have missed some part of the What exactly did the participants see every round, and was there a network structure, or did that really... Yes, yes, no, I will tell you, yeah. I should have explained this a little bit slower. So this is actually a snapshot of the screen. And this is telling you the network structure. This was a lattice in which you play with your eight neighbors. Everybody received the information of what the neighbors did before, given by the color, and the payoffs they got in the previous round, given by the number. And this is the payoff matrix. This is, we try to avoid framing by referring to cooperation or defection. We just named by colors. Okay? I can comment on and that also later. What happens in the corners of the matrix? They interact with the other ones. They, you should oh, think, yeah, it's but periodic. You should so think of it as a torus. Okay? Is this now uh, clearer? I apologize. I should have really explained this better. This is the original setup of the simulations of Nowak and May. Mm -hmm. so you, let me... you, see, uh, how much, you only see the action from the last round. You can't go to history. Yeah, and, and we don't let them have anything to take notes over or anything. So they have to, was whatever they remain, they, they remember, they remember in there. Yeah. Yes? Was they allowed to talk to each other? No. That's why we put these cardboards there. And, and we had, in every classroom, we had, it was like an exam. We had a, some person looking at them. But the people who are next to you are not necessarily... Not necessarily your neighbors. No. Yeah. We told them so. We told them so. Your neighbors could actually be in other building. Okay? No, your neighbors, your physical neighbors, most of the times are not your virtual neighbors on the lattice. But and did you say that you reshuffle people every round? When we do the control part. In the beginning, we let them play with the same set of people for some 40-something rounds. Okay. Then we stopped and we told them. They had to click, I understood, to make sure that they knew that after that they were going to be reshuffled. In the second? Uh, 
Yeah, and then in the third part, we told them you are back again in fixed configuration. That's a good point. We debated among ourselves a lot. We showed them the information, their uh, old neighbors did. Okay? So that was, we told them, this is not going to tell you anything about your new neighbors. Because we're going to show you what your old neighbors did in the previous one. But that's a good question. So that's just for one round? Yeah. Yes. And when you put them back, no, they were in, at other place. Did you actually make sure that there was no overlap whatsoever, or was it just random? It was just random. But then we look at the things, and I seem to remember that there was no a single case of overlap. OK? Good. So then we checked, like I was saying, to see whether there was any evidence for imitation of the best neighbor around. And from this data, all I can conclude is that there isn't, because if I reshuffle my data, I see the same amount of imitation to a very high accuracy than what I see from the real data. So I can't conclude that there is imitation. Even if there were, it wouldn't be perfect because only 70% of the cases in which should be imitations were actually imitation. People would not be imitating always the best guy. But still, I cannot distinguish that from randomness, so I don't have evidence for unconditional imitation. On top of that, simulations tell me that if there were full and conditional limitation, I should observe cooperation, and I don't. Yes? To imitate best neighbors, they should have known the total cumulative payoff of the neighbors. They had access to that? No, the rule, the rule is local in time as well. You copy the neighbor that has done best in the previous round only. You don't look at the accumulated payoff. Yes? Yeah, you do the simulations like Noah and May did, and if people were all copying their best neighbor, you should observe cooperation if you started with a population of 50-50 cooperators and effectors. In our first round, we had 60% of cooperation, so. Okay, now this is the main finding of our paper so far. What we did observe is the following. People behaved in a way that is very reminiscent of what has been observed in public good games of conditional cooperation. Conditional cooperation means that I cooperate more the more cooperation I see around me. So it's some sort of reciprocity if you want. Now what we did observe, which was completely new, is the following. If you look at what people did after they themselves cooperated, you have the green lines. This is the probability of cooperating as a function of the people who cooperated around me in the previous round, after I myself cooperated. Whereas the blue lines are the probability of, cooper of cooperating after I myself defected in the previous round. And you see an enormous difference in both cases. And like you'll see later, this is very robust. So this is something we firmly believe in. You not only cooperate more when people cooperate more around you, there's also your mood. Once you defect, you get angry. You say, okay, forget about it. I won't cooperate. Only every now and then just to see what happens. And you see this, the line we go through the points has a little bit of a negative slope, but a flat line could also be uh, a reasonable approximation of this. So what we observe is this dependence. And I believe that if you go back to all these experiments on public good games and differentiate in terms of your cooperation or not in the previous round, you'd see the same. So conditional cooperation is, in fact, moody. We check that by randomizing, and when you randomize, you lose the dependence on the context, but you don't lose the dependence on the previous step because you are just randomizing the, the players around. Okay? Well, we did some uh, modeling, uh, uh, and we basically reproduced with an agent-based model using this strategy plus the fact that some other people were just defecting and a few were cooperators we could reproduce most of the features of the experiment. So that's, uh, uh, so we checked that what we were doing was at least consistent, okay? Now, this discussion refers to other experiments. Uh, I don't think I have time. I have more on this 
of uh, very recent of last week, but I can tell you there were a previous experiment by the group of Manfred Bilinski in Ploen in Germany. And they look at a very much smaller lattice, 4x4, four four, but they made 20-something realizations of the lattice with different people. And this is their cooperation behavior, very similar to ours. They tried to see whether there was this proportional imitation, but they only show some evidence for it, but they had to add a lot of mutation on top of that. If there is 30% mutation, you cannot really say that people are using that rule. 30% mutation is 30% of the times you just go against your rule. So. But they also saw evidence of this conditional cooperation. This is the probability to cooperate as a function of the cooperative neighbors. But they didn't split it up. If I have time, I will show you the plot later. But we have just recently reanalyzed their data, and their data confirmed this dependence on the previous time step. Yep. Uh, so it's not really a one-shot game. No, it's an iterated game. So you might actually, so will you discuss this repeated aspect later? Uh, no, we, we haven't really gone into that. The point is that in principle there you could have an equilibrium. Yes. And, but from the viewpoint of the people who have been uh, doing this is like in your simulations, the agents don't remember anything. So it's every time it's a one-shot game, if you compare with simulations. But of course, you're right. People are not memoryless agents. So they may be interpreting the game as an iterated game. That I cannot prevent. So let me make my point clear. What I'm trying to see here is whether these simulations with memoryless agents have anything to do with the way people behave. And the reason may be that they are thinking of this as an, iter as an iterated game. OK, so this was highlighted in several places. And the main point is that all the models that those, uh, until that date were not really describing well the results of our study. So there was much more to, uh, to do. OK, so second part, some theory. I will be quick about this. Yes. The fact, that, the fact that we don't see cooperation on a lattice, plus further evidence I'll show you later. But so far, I'm, I'm, what I'm showing you is that there was this prediction that on a lattice, on a prisoner's dilemma, I should observe cooperation. Well, I don't. Yeah, that's a good point. I don't see zero either. And you never see zero. In all experiments I've seen, with or without networks, with public goods, or with there's always this kind of residual level of cooperation. That I think the point Melinda is making is that you know if you want to say that networks are natural, you probably want to and now it's not the natural way to do it would be to look at a bunch of networks. And I'm, I'll 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 get to that. I see. Sorry. I'll get to that. Yeah. So I'm going to go quickly through this because I see that the most important point is the other one. We try to look simply at whether or not, using the replicator equation, you could not explain where this Moody conditional cooperation strategy comes from, but whether the coexistence of these Moody conditional cooperators with defectors and with cooperators could be stable. That's it. They're taken for granted. There's only these three types of guys. You look at how they evolve in time. Okay. So this is what we did. We have three strategies in the population. They interact from an infinitely iterated prisoner's dilemma. Then you can have a replicator equation. I'm going to be really quick about this because I want just to make the point that when you do the calculations and you plug in the strategies we observed in the experiment, the slopes of the conditional cooperation and everything, you don't see any coexistence between Moody conditional cooperators, defectors, and cooperators. Apparently, they can't coexist if we believe in the replicator dynamics approach. However, if you take into account that these results, of course, will have some error, we were also able to look into parameters close to those of the experiments, and we were able to find interior points in which coexistence of the three types of strategy was possible. However, I'm sitting here because I'm showing you what happens when in this population people are only playing pairwise prisoner's dilemma. 
if you have them play in three in groups of three or of four, you still can find interior points. But if you, it's difficult. You have to really tune the parameters. And we were not able to show that this was possible for five players. And on top of that, for an infinite number of players, we showed that these are the only possible face portraits. So it seems that this coexistence is not really easy to achieve. So that's not explaining our results. So that motivated us to do some more, uh, some more experimental work. So we went back to the lab and we progressed a little bit. Now we didn't have a lab that was just cardboard. We went to the economics department with our friends and we used a decent lab. So that was some progress. This was much easier. We didn't suffer like in the other case. And uh, what we did was, was exactly that. Have groups of people. There's no network here. Okay? Just groups of people, two, three, four, and five. A bunch of groups. And having them play a multiplayer prisoner's dilemma. Okay? But there's no networks. They're independent. We're just trying to assess whether you could still see this moody conditional cooperation. Okay? And this is crucial to the point you were making, actually. So, we look at this. Here we have a very nice result, which is the fact that uh, we have very long uh, series of runs, up to 100. When you have two people playing the prisoner's dilemma for so long, you actually see cooperation increasing. But for three, four, and five, you already see the same kind of behavior, like in the network case, or in the public good game, that the cooperation decreases up to levels around 20, 25%, maybe 30%. So it seems that in this case, three is a crowd. So you can only cooperate with two if you are with another person. And that's, we believe it's because when I get angry because you defected on me and I defect, I affect the other guy who might have cooperated in the previous one. So, but anyway, my main point here is that we again observed the same kind of behavior of moody conditional cooperation. Look at the points only, the lines come from a model I'm not going to discuss in view of the time. So the points tell you again that no matter what's the size of the group, you still see this moody conditional cooperation. Okay, so I'm skipping the model. And uh, yeah, like I said, my, my point here is moody conditional cooperation is confirmed. Now, why is this important? And that gets me to your point. Back to the model. Now, we did another model. Okay, a very simple model. In physics, it's called a very simple mean field calculation. What you assume is that there is no network. Okay, and then you have a proportion of, uh, of people playing cooperator, playing defector, or playing moody conditional cooperation. Okay, and everyone has its own probability of cooperate. So the average cooperation level you observe is the sum of these terms here. Okay, so from here, and a very simple calculation, self-consistent, you uh, impose that the cooperation level should be some level, and then you find that this rule should be obeyed, where A and B contain the parameters of the Moody conditional cooperators. So if they change, this changes, and this relation changes. Okay? So here is what we found, but plotted. The lines, if you look at here, when you have a given number of cooperators and a given number of defectors, you will find always a given level of cooperation. Now, this is assuming that people interact with everybody else. This is a mean field. So these are the lines in which cooperation is constant. Okay? These lines correspond to cooperation level. And these colors arise from just a simulation when everybody interacts with everybody. Okay? So they agree perfectly. I mean, it can be otherwise. But the point is that this simulation is exactly the same if you do it on a lattice, if you do it on an Ertos Rangi network, if you do it on a scale free network, no matter what you do, you always get the same picture. Always. So this simple calculation predicts that if you have cooperators, defectors, and moody conditional cooperators, the level of cooperation you're going to see does not depend on the network and is the same as if there were no network. Okay? Am I getting closer to showing my point? The prediction is that the level of cooperation I'm observing is the same with any kind of network, even with no network. If these are the strategies people use. So this is a very definite and clear prediction. So then, what we did... Sorry, is this, uh, this is again based on... So how, what is this? Uh, 
I missed it. There's a slide with different types. And yeah, we have, you have a certain amount fixed of cooperators, people who always cooperate, a certain amount of defectors, and a certain amount of moody conditional cooperators. So this cooperate, we assume that they cooperate with a fixed probability, which is high, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, something like that. Defectors practically never cooperate. We also, this is a fixed number. And this is a number that depends on the context. Okay, so you have to compute the probability that these guys cooperate in time t plus one as a function of the cooperation in times t. And from there, and self-consistency, you get that this relationship has to be obeyed. We can go through the details later if you want. So, so in that plot that you showed, that you're in the, uh, the simplex plot, so what are you keeping constant uh, uh, These lines, these lines correspond to lines which predict that the cooperation level should be fixed. Okay. But you're keeping P of T and P of, big P of C and big P of D fixed, are you? Yes, yes, yes. So what are, they, what are those values? Oh, excuse me. Uh, those values were, what we did was, uh, Oh, excuse me, again. Wrong button. Oh, I'm sorry. There. There. Uh, what we used was point 0.1 for the defectors. No, point 0.2 for the defectors, point 0.8 for the cooperators. Okay? But the results change only slightly if you use point 0.9 and point 0.1 or something like that. So they are not pure. They, every now and then they change their mind, but they are almost pure. And again, the prediction is this. This is what Minfield tells you, but this is exactly, I'm not showing different plots because they are all the same. Yes? When you look at the simulation of the network, you just assume that you are dropping these different types of random on the network. Yeah, so this is averaged. But in reality, you would, you would think, for example, I mean, there, there is you know, formation of, of social links, and the cooperators would form links among themselves, that's a, good, that's a good question. That's a very good question. First, even if the network is given, you by chance could have a cluster in which everybody cooperated, and those should do well. But for doing well, they should always stick for cooperation, to cooperation. The minute one of them gets greedy and defects once, it breaks this cluster. But not if the cluster is the fixed cooperator. That's right. If they were completely fixed, they, that would stay. But unfortunately, even in, in our larger simulation, we saw something like 1% tops of fixed cooperators. So the chances that you have such a cluster, unless you go to a very large network, are really very small. But you could have it. You could have it. And then the other thing you mentioned is very important. If you allow them to form their own links, that's a different story. And there are experiments showing evidence for cooperation. So, okay, so then the mean field agrees with the cooperation level on lattices or on scale-free networks. So this prediction is testable, so let's go for it. Yes, again, the largest experiment ever, Redux. So this is what we did, but instead of having 169 people, we went to 1,200 something. And this was already something. This was really very, very uh, interesting, but there, my friends in, in Zaragoza did most of the job, and the programmers there were terrific. In fact, we got sponsored also by a dissemination program in the region of Aragon, who allowed us to contact with high schools in the whole of the region of Aragon. You will see that in a second. We used 42 high schools, last year students, so just prior to university. And we placed them, half of them on a lattice, and half of them in a heterogeneous network. Why I say heterogeneous? Because it tries to be a scale-free network, but it's not. It has degrees only between 2 and 16, which is reasonable for a network that size, but with a network of 600, you cannot have a half with 100 connections. So it's sort of a scale-free network. However, having seen papers published in serious economic journals on scale-free networks with 12 people, I'm kind of happy with this. Okay, so this is actually the geography of the experiment. Now, people were really very far away from each other. This is the province of Zaragoza. This is the Pyrenees here. Barcelona is here, Madrid is here. So these are high schools in the province of Zaragoza, high schools in the province of Huesca, and high schools in the province of Teruel. And uh, people in the same high school need not be playing in the same network in any of the two we had, 
and of course their neighbors would be different or so. And this was really an event. So we went from putting cardboard on computer rooms to having an event with a whole uh, auditorium for us. We showed, uh, these are the programmers who did an excellent job. Uh, this is the media and this is the presentation of the experiment. So this was really intended to be a show. Now we had a small problem in the beginning of the experiment and we were really scared because several authorities were there. And then we thought, oh, maybe we could have run the experiment two days earlier and then just show the results. Yeah, no, we tried to do it live. So next time I'll do it this other way around. Okay, so this is actually the experiment in real time. We were describing what was going on. And this is what we saw, actually. So this animation, what shows is the fact that people are really working with people in other parts of the province. The red lines are instances of cooperation, no defection. The green lines are instances of cooperation. And these are the rounds we were playing. So this is just to insist on the fact that people were very far away from each other. But at the same time, you're already seeing how cooperation evolves in time. I will not bore you with this kind of uh, thing, but go. Excuse me? Yeah, let me go to this one. So there are two networks. This lattice here rolled up as a torus, as we were discussing before. And this is the heterogeneous network. So there are two separate populations, 600 something on one, 600 something on the other. And these are the degree distribution. So this is regular, and this has this degree distribution. This is the, it was generated with a configuration model, so this is the theoretical degree distribution, and this is this particular realization, how it was. Okay? So there are two lattices, the populations are different. We did what we did in the previous experiment. First time, first set of rounds fixed, next uh, set of rounds in which they were reshuffled. Period that people that were reshuffled here kept their number of neighbors. Okay, we did the reshuffling, keeping the number of neighbors in this case here. And this is what we see. This is the percentage of cooperation on the lattice and on the heterogeneous network, decaying as in the previous round. This is the control doing exactly the same as in the previous round. Maybe some more cooperation. This is around 30%. Here, you see that it's still decaying. And my bet is that if you go to larger and larger sizes, it takes longer to decay. In fact, some of this decay is not explained by this population being constant with constant proportions of cooperators, defectors, and moody conditional cooperators. But rather, we observed that uh, that some of the uh, moody conditional cooperators were switching to being defectors. I will show evidence for that in a second. But from here, I see that there is not network reciprocity. It doesn't matter whether I have my people on a lattice or on a scale-free network, I get the same. Exactly the same thing. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So one thing I notice is that these numbers are a bit apart, right? The yeah. The yes. Is that, is that, I mean, I'm just you you really you really very good observer. Yes. The point is that we believe that this effect comes from the difference in the initial amount of people who decided to cooperate. When you take this shift into account and put together the lines and look past a kolmogorov of test on the distributions, they are the same. Exactly the same. They, uh, let me say, they are not significantly different. And there's, I, can, I don't have the numbers here with me, but I can give you the, it was P less than 10 to the minus 3 or something like that. We look at the distribution, yes. So even if you look, see these differences, they come, I believe, that from the initial thing. If you look here, they began more closely, and then you see yellow points creeping up in the control part. Yeah, but you have a good eye. I have to be careful with you. Okay, so this is actually this histogram here, the number of cooperative actions the number of players that took a given number of cooperative actions. If we look into that for every 10 rounds, you see 
that as time progresses, you see more and more people going into defection. And this is what we believe comes from the fact that some moody conditional cooperation is turning into defectors, pure defectors. People are just getting sick of each other. And this agrees with the questionnaires, by the way. I haven't talked about the questionnaires, but in the questionnaires you see lots of people that say, oh, life is so ugly, you begin cooperating and then all you receive is defection and then I turn to defection, but I don't want to. Lots of them. So this is again the same thing. If you look in the control and look at the percentage of people who cooperated less than a given threshold, in the control there's not that much change, but in the networks there is change. There's people that are really getting a little bit angry. And again, you see moody conditional cooperation. In both, uh, in, even in the control, you are seeing some of it, but not so clear. But in the lattice and in the heterogeneous network, you see it. So this is another confirmation of that. We looked at the dependence on the pay of differences to see whether they were using any update rule based on pay of differences. We look at the probabilities to cooperate or to defect as a function of the observed pay of difference with the higher pay off around me. And the probability to cooperate and to defect is the same. So we believe that there's no really influence of the pay of difference, as I observe. And this is the results in terms of the degree. In the heterogeneous network, you can look at the degree and you see that it seems like people with higher degree cooperate less, but the statistics, of course, for the higher degrees is poor. Okay, yeah, I'm finishing. So even for the degrees two, three, and four, it's, it's the same. So this is a 10 home message. And uh, I think that this is basically it. I said most of what is here. I want to make the point of this Moody conditional cooperation that we observed in three experiments. I want to insist that my claim is only for the prisoner's dilemma. If you go to other game, I don't know what happens. Only for humans, if you do this with bacteria, I don't know what happens. So that's it. And again, as uh, you were saying, there are experiments, at least in two groups, in which you allow people to form their own links, or to, at least to break links with the factors, then you can observe cooperation. So this is for a fixed network. Okay, and I think this is it. Thank you very much. <laughs>